We're very pleased to have Gillian Brockell, who's with Post TV, <laughs> uh, and David Gura, who's with Mar NPR's Marketplace. Um, you have their full bios in front of you. I'm not going to waste the time with them, but they're both experts in what they do, and they are going to talk about what they do, who they work for, and give you some great tips, and you've already got the handout. So, David, are you starting? I'll start, yeah. Oh, thanks Is that so right? Much. Yeah. Um, well, thanks for having me in the, the much-coveted mid-afternoon post-lunch <laughs> spot that I remember well. So um, I will try to be brief and field as many of your, your questions as you'd like. But um, So I work for Marketplace, which is like uh, NPR, so the same but different. Um, so we're produced by American oh, Public Media. Sorry. So, no, it's <laughs> like I've become very practiced at this. Um, and uh, so it's... And I listen to it on my NPR station. Exactly. There you go. <laughs> Teed it up well. Um, <laughs> so we have a really small bureau here. There are three of us uh, who work out of here. And if you if you haven't heard the show, we cover business and finance and economics and uh, try to make it palatable, uh, if not fun. And uh, that can be challenging here because um, we kind of seed politics to NPR. They're going to cover that day in and day out. They have a bigger staff, a bigger budget. <coughs> um, so we sort of focus on um, the policy itself, um, maybe the quirkier sort of money stories based out of here. So that's um, fun and challenging. Um, as I said, the show's in LA, so that geographical distance becomes very apparent sometimes when uh, stories are happening here and you have to sort of convey to them why the debt ceiling is something that everybody here is talking about and why invariably it comes down to the uh, 12th, 11th hour, 12th hour, whatever the phrase is, I'll look it up every time. But um, anyway, just a bit about what I do on a day-to-day -day basis. It's a pretty small reporting staff show-wide. There are 17 of us, um, mostly in LA. We have folks in New York, DC, uh, Portland, Oregon, oddly. Uh, and then <laughs> there's someone in London and someone in Shanghai. Um, so in a given week, I'll be working on probably one feature story. And then um, I'll do two or three what we call spot stories. So just a two-minute story that's done on a pretty fast turnaround for either the evening show or the morning show. and. Um, Again, the LA distance makes it really strange. Their morning meeting is at 8 o'clock their time, so um, that's late in DC. I'll get a story assignment around 11.30. Um, have to turn it around pretty quickly for an edit at 3.30 Eastern, and then the show tapes in LA at 5 p.m. Eastern. So it's um, intense. It can be intense, mostly because you're starting when everybody's at lunch and it's hard to get people, <laughs> <laughs> hard to get people lined up. Um, before I did this, I was a producer at NPR, so there I was booking a lot of guests and cutting interviews and uh, all of that. And um, I kind of <laughs> wanted to report, so I, I made the shift over about three years ago now. And um, so I just wanted to talk um, briefly about what it's like to be interviewed and um, what it's like to interview as well. And I think that um, public radio especially has been in a pretty good position. Um, after 9-11, listenership really went up. Um, you know, I think that uh, Marketplace counts in aggregate um, about 10 million listeners a week uh, on about 500 stations across the country. Uh, NPR's audience is bigger still, so like Morning Edition I think has 17 to 20 million depending on who counts um, in the morning. So the audience is there. I think the challenge for the industry, the challenge within public radio is um, terrestrial radio as it's called. It's kind of going to disappear at some point and people are going to listen uh, on iPhones or through wireless internet. And so what does that change mean? Um, you know, right now there are about 800 public radio stations across the country of varying size and strength. And, um, you know, there, there are many who say those that will survive when you don't need the FM or AM signal anymore, those that have their own news departments and do their own local reporting. So there's this kind of focus in the industry on, um, you know, making WAMU sound different from the station in New York or the station in Miami or wherever. Um, so, there's some apprehension and some nervousness, but um, I will say it's been, in terms of the medium, sort of a good place to be, although my grandmother thinks it's, you know, radio is such a thing of the past. But anyway, anyway so we have this, um, uh, and I'd say, like, there's, there's also this awareness that the, the focus needs to be on um, the digital side of things as it is everywhere, and so um, that's very plastic. It's been evolving, you know. It's like if you go to Marketplace's website or NPR's website, um, what's the likelihood that you're going to sit there and listen to a three or five minute piece it's in, in its entirety? You know, if there's an audio slideshow, you're going to sit through it. Would you rather just read a transcript of the piece? Would you rather us like rewrite it as a print story? So um, 
all that stuff is changing and people are trying to figure it out. Um, but I will say both at American Public Media and NPR, um, a lot of time and money is being invested in sort of that side of things. And whereas when I first started, that relationship seemed kind of adversarial, that um, there were like radio purists and then there were all these hires on the digital side and one didn't know what to make of the other. I think there's a lot more collaboration and that's a nice segue to what I was gonna say just about um, reporting for radio. It's gotten much easier and I think much easier for somebody who doesn't do it on a day in day out basis to do. Um, obviously, like a lot of my reporting I'll, I'll do with an iPhone now. Um, the quality isn't quite as good, um, but it's handy. Um, if I'm recording an interview with somebody I might have done it by phone in the past, call him up in his office, um, you know, it'd be phone quality tape, that'd be fine. Now I can do um, what we call an iPhone sync and just using the voice memos app on the iPhone, I'll talk to him on the landline as we would have before and he'll hold his iPhone in front of his mouth, record that and send me the file and I'll have it in pretty good quality. Um, so I know you're gonna get into Skype and all that, I'll leave that card for you as well. But, um, you know, stuff like that, uh, really makes a difference and um, I'll say that just even the equipment that I use and I can show you some of it if you'd like but it's like all digital now um, all the editing is done digitally and that's I think something crazy like I got to my first internship at NPR was in 2003 and they'd just gone all digital at that point so even after 9-11 they were still cutting tape with razor blades so it was sort of a kicking and screaming um, <laughs> move to, <laughs> to all digital but um, it's very easy to learn I think if you look at reporters who've gone to places like marketplace and NPR like yes there are those who've been in radio a long time have started out at a station and moved there but increasingly um, this is definitely the case with NPR they'll hire a print reporter who they're gonna hire someone to cover the Justice Department why not hire the well-sourced print reporter who um, is at least game to learn how to report for radio. And again, it's much easier. Like there's a kind of four to six week crash course they can do. And, um, you know, I think a lot of people who've done that have been really successful at NPR. Um, so uh, as I ramble here, uh, I just wanted to say like, uh, I know that one thing that Linda wanted me to talk about is just sort of what it's like to be interviewed for radio. Um, you know, in my job, I'm often called upon by stations around the country to talk about what I've been reporting on or what's happening in DC in general and um, you very well maybe as well <laughs> and I think that the way that I approach that is just when I get that I hope I'm not stepping on what somebody said earlier but when I get that call just try to get as clear a sense as possible of what that show wants out of you how long the interview mm -hmm. is going to be and that's not to say overthink it but um, you know if you're going to do a 20 minute hit on a live show that's one thing versus maybe talking to a producer for a few minutes and them using excerpts of it. So just, you know, I, I would encourage you just to be curious and clear about that when you're talking to a producer. Um, and then as far as taking, I mean, in, in that process, in that pre-interview process, um, be curious about what shape the interview might take. I know um, when I was at NPR, I was booking for Talk of the Nation among other shows. So that was like a really long format live call-in show. And while I wouldn't give away a question line. I would definitely be game to talk to a reporter about the arc of that interview or what we hope to accomplish. Um, and that's so useful, I think, um, I'd like to think for reporters we talk to. Just, you know, if you can go into that interview with just a bullet pointed list of what you, you know, have thought about in advance, um, maybe use that to write down a few facts or points that you want to come across. Um, I think that's really helpful. Uh, in the job that I have now, I do a lot of live Q&As with the hosts and um, the way that they prepare for those interviews varies a lot. Um, there are some who really like them to be pretty well scripted. They want to know that if it's supposed to be a five-minute interview, we're going to talk for five minutes. And the best way to do that in their mind is uh, me having kind of written it out so that I know it times out to five minutes. But um, that's not always the case. Um, I'd encourage you not to sort of overthink it. I think um, if I had one sort of sage piece of advice to give, it's put a lot of faith in the person who's interviewing you. I think that there are very few bad interviewers, probably both in TV and radio. And um, something that Kai Rizdal, who hosts Mark this evening, has said to me is that uh, his goal is to make the interviewee, the reporter, the person he's talking to feel as comfortable as possible and not sound like an idiot. And there are exceptions to that, I think, when <laughs> <laughs> often not with reporters, but like with big name, big name people. But sure. um, that's not the goal. Um, the goal is to make him and you sound as good as possible. So um, just have faith in the fact that if you're asked something 
that stumps <clears throat> you or you lose your train of thought, a good interviewer is going to um, help you out in a pinch like that. And you know, either there'll be a follow up or just move along. And um, anyhow, I'll leave it there, and maybe chime in after you talk as well. But sure. Um, hi, I'm Gillian. Uh, so I guess I'll just talk a little bit um, about what I'm doing at the Post. Uh, so about a year ago, the Post decided to launch Post TV. They've invested a lot in it. And um, the original plan was to have three shows um, that were only on the web, also available on Google TV and Yoroku and things like that. And so I worked on In Play, uh, which was the sort of clippy, fast-moving um, political show with a little bit of interview, but not too, too much. Um, there was also a longer one-subject uh, political show, kind of like uh, the stream on Al Jazeera, if any of you have ever seen that. And, um, and then there was The Fold, which sort of featured... Um, uh, the the video journalists uh, feature pieces. Uh, so one of the most successful um, parts of In Play was this segment that we developed called State View, where we are finding and, and highlighting the political stories that are happening in smaller local areas and showing that, you know, it's sort of a microcosm for what's happening nationally and sort of wanting to cast an eye on a, a, a glance to all of the really good work that um, some local reporters are doing. And so that was great, but I also, in, in the course of that, came into contact with um, a ton of people who've never been on Skype before um, <laughs> and had to walk them through it. And, you know, a lot of them, it would be their first TV interview or the biggest interview they'd ever had, even though, you know, we as the Washington Post are thinking of Post TV as this sort of like fun sort of startup that's happening on the side, you know, for them it's it's a big deal that the Post is calling. And so, um, so yeah, so, and before that I worked on a morning interview radio show at Federal News Radio. Um, same thing, interviewing people and getting people ready for interviews who are not interviewed a lot. Um, so I just have this tip sheet here that we can go through. Um, the stuff on the top is just basic stuff that um, anyone, any print reporter uh, can use for any kind of uh, TV interview, whether it's broadcast or web TV. And then I have some stuff specific to Skype interviews, which are really becoming more and more common. And if a producer remembers you as a person who technically is easy to work with, <laughs> you know, it may be unfair, but you are more likely to be called in the future um, on, on another story. Um, and, I mean, we worked with the Texas Tribune a lot, and we would ask for specific reporters toward, um, toward as our relationship developed just because we knew that they were better at Skype than others were, and for no other reason. Um, so anyway, so uh, just the the first thing is is just to have a great open, um, a great first line, something kicky, something punchy, something to do with you know just like a print story, the most recent thing that has happened. But you can go ahead and put your analysis and your personality into that first line, and that's something that I would prepare um, in advance. And then, you know, have bullet points, one or two things of what else you would like to say. But other, like David was saying, the, the host or the person interviewing you is not the enemy. They want to make you look good. So they're, they're going to help you out. But have the general idea of what you want to say. And also working with the producer, asking them what they're looking for. Um, very helpful. Um, you can practice with people beforehand just to make sure that you're you know, not going off on, you know, bunny trails and getting a little too lost into the story. But we do really like, um, especially in the State View interviews, you know, those, those little anecdotes, those quick little anecdotes, those are, those go so great um, 
in video interviews and on air, and you can use first person. And so one of, some of the things that we loved, some of the, the you know, tidbits and morsels that we would get from these state view interviews that you couldn't get anywhere else with people being, would people, you know, would be the reporters telling us like, well, I asked him and, you know, th it was just dead air, you know, and that's not something that they're gonna write in an article. Um, and so that was really nice. Uh, doo -doo 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 -doo. And then, yeah, if you don't know the answer to the question, you don't have to pretend that you know the answer. <laughs> like, just just memorizing the quick line of, that's a good question, and we don't have an answer yet, but we will, or, you know, that's a good question, and one that we'll be asking in the coming days and months, you know, like, just have that in your, in your back pocket. And then also, we would um, frequently run into trouble where people were so experienced with their... Um, with their beat that they wouldn't introduce who people were. So uh, pay attention to whether the host has previously explained. If you're bringing in a character, you know whether, like I have here, you know, is has Chris Eliza already said David Dewhurst, the lieutenant governor of Texas, can, and can you now just say Dewhurst? Or do you need to say, well, that's something that David Dewhurst said about Ted Cruz, and he's the lieutenant governor of Texas who lost the primary to him, you know, da da da. Um, and in terms of how to act, you don't suddenly need to, you know, be a, a TV host and have like some sort of anchor stance. Like, do be yourself. We really, really like that. Especially radio, too. Like, that's something that I used to say to, to people is that, like, if you have an accent, that is awesome. Do not get rid of it. Like, radio loves accents. And, like, we love, you know, personality, but turn it off a little bit. You know, not turned up to 11, but, like, you know, 8 or 9. Um, and then also, if you, are, if you do know that you're someone who tends to be a bit monotone or you know, not very animated, a great way to, to just get that energy quickly is to use your hands a lot and just gesticulate. And that also works for radio. If, if you're well. afraid yeah. that your voice <laughs> sounds really boring, just start moving your hands when you talk and it'll sound better. Or just don't hit the mic. <laughs> and, um, and then but that's not the right advice for if you're on TV, right? Mm -hmm. You don't want to all of a sudden... Well, not crazily, but certainly you want to. You can still definitely gesture with your hands. Um, be crazy in radio, though. That's fine. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, you can be as crazy as you want. And then, actually, he. I have here. Heed the lesson of Marco Rubio. Have your water with you, <laughs> with the cap already off. And I'm actually gonna have some. There you go. <laughs> I am. I am a person like Marco Rubio, who gets a dry mouth when I'm speaking in front of a group of people. It's just something that happens. And it happens faster than you think it will. And it'll happen. You'll be like, it's not going to happen this time, and it will. So just have the water with you. Um, it's, much, it's much less awkward to have someone pause to take a sip of water than to have them being like, the whole time. Right? Like we've seen, you, we've seen the gif, right? Like the Marco Rubio gif that will forever be him with a dry mouth like over and over again. Um, in terms of what to wear and, and how to look like, this stuff may sound shallow, but you don't want the good content and good reporting that you have um, to share to be um, overshadowed by distractions. So wearing pure white, especially if you have pale skin, usually looks pretty bad on TV. Wearing stripes, seersucker, polka dots, um, terrible things happen when you're on screen. <laughs> if you've heard of raying, I mean, it looks like you're suddenly like in like a weird like 1960s laugh-in video where, you know, it's, it's getting very strange. Um, so, <laughs> and then, um, and then also same if you have darker skin, wearing black, just straight black is something to avoid because again, you'll be washed out. Um, doo -doo -doo -doo. And then, okay, so for Skype interviews, having the earbuds with the little microphone are absolutely ideal. It's going to give you um, the best sound in, just in terms of your audio. It's also going to greatly, greatly decrease the chance of there being like a fuzzy 
um, connection error where suddenly your face freezes and you get the mechanical voice and everything because of the mix minus. Um, the, the mics on your computer can get flooded. And if that happens, your image will freeze. And um, yes, and I'll show you a great example of an awesome interview that was um, almost destroyed by that. By, some <laughs> <laughs> by an amazing, wonderful, awesome reporter who I have immense respect for but refuses to use um, the little thing in his ear and the little microphone. Um, light on your face and not shining behind you. And if you have to, you know, move the desk lamp behind your computer just for a couple minutes, you know, go for it. Um, again, hardwired connection. You don't want a weak Wi-Fi signal um, to ruin the really great content that you have to share. Um, uh, another thing, I'll show you a couple examples uh, with these, with um, our state views of having the computer above you or below you just doesn't feel right. It feels a little strange and weird. You know, we, ha we did one interview with this wonderful reporter in Boston, but she just looks like a little girl that you don't really take seriously because the camera is way up here. And then there's another guy who did his interview from his kitchen who is an extremely experienced um, journalist in New Mexico. Nobody knows New Mexico politics like this guy, but he's standing above his computer with his microwave, his microwave in the background, and you're just like, <laughs> oh, man, like, you know, and we're trying to get him to move the computer to get the microwave out of there, and then it's, it was just not working. So that also brings up um, background, um, especially if you're doing your interview from home. You just want to make sure that... Um, what behind you, what's behind you is simple, but not too simple. Um, you know, just so a plain white background can look sterile and, and uh, you know, a little freaky. Um, but yeah, you, you want to make sure it's not too domestic either. <laughs> and, um, and then the, another thing that I'll show you in a minute is making sure that you're looking at the camera on your uh, computer screen and not at the the image that you're seeing, the Skype Im image that you're seeing, and especially not at the picture of you. Um, <laughs> and what we what we do and what I think Al Jazeera does as well when we do our Skype interviews is we actually turn off our camera to get a, a stronger signal from you just so there's less stuff going through the wires. It tends to improve the image. So if you're doing a Skype interview frequently, you won't be able to see the host. You'll just be able to hear them. And so you want to make sure that you're looking at the camera. It's really tempting to like look down and be like, do I look professional? Do I look like a real you know, journalist or whatever? But by looking down, you don't. <laughs> <laughs> so, um, yeah. So that's that's basically what I what I've learned over the last few months um, with a, a lot of these really awesome, amazing, and um, work heavy interviews. Um, but you want to kind of jump I in before you? I yes, realize I gave a handout and didn't talk about it, which is always yeah. good. <laughs> yeah, yeah, yeah. Um, so this is I've taken this from Jay Allison, who's a public radio producer. Uh, who's been around a long time and runs a website called transom.org um, and I highly recommend that to, to everybody um, t-r-a-n-s-o-m.org and uh, he's based on Cape Cod lucky guy that he is and um, there is like, a site with great reviews of equipment if you were thinking of buying a digital recorder um, they're sort of systematically and regularly reviewed on there um, he reviews mics, he reviews software as well. Um, a lot of links to sort of free versions of that stuff if you wanted to just sort of try stuff out. Um, and so maybe I'll walk through a couple of these before you show your blooper reel. Um, <laughs> and I just, like his first line here is so awesome, which is um, as you talk about wearing a white shirt and all of that, I think the beauty of radio is that uh, I can be unshaven and wearing my bean boots today and uh, all as well. So um, that helps just setting up an interview or doing an interview. I don't know how many of you are sort of called upon to do collect audio while you're out, and maybe that's happening more um, with print reporters, but um, it's a comfortable medium in that way that I can call someone and say, can I come by your office for an interview? Uh, it'll take me one minute to set up, and 
there is no camera, which is a, a huge perk still for me. Um, and uh, I wanted to just point out a few things here. Remember eye contact, and um, maybe I'll demonstrate using one of my crazy mics. Um, in radio, you really want to get close to the person you're talking to. Um, so even if you're recording for your own self, for your website, um, like this is a mic that I use pretty frequently, which is sort of a durable omnidirectional mic that um, also doubles as a hammer. You can like run it over. <laughs> it's like amazingly heavy. But it, sa it seems like really goofy, but like you want to be within like six inches of the person you're talking to. And so that can be like an awkward exercise. Which leads me to my next point, which is that that can also work to your advantage. Um, to sort of um, somebody I he mentions this, somebody I worked with said this as well. Like use it to like scratch your shoulder or make it seem like it's an appendage of your body, um, and people are going to start forgetting what it is. And that's especially true when I use my shotgun mic, which looks like a like small squirrel or something. But um, again, it's like that may be uncomfortable. Oh, you want that back? <laughs> yeah, what can I go straight there? How about that? Yeah, there you go. Um, oh, oh, here's a guy in the <laughs> Anyway, so you don't have to be quite as close with this one. Yeah, I'll live to regret that, I'm sure. Um, Everyone looks beautiful. Yeah, they look good. Um, but like with, too it's too late. It's out there. Um, but with stuff like that, it can be awkward to have that conversation with an interview subject, like, I gotta be yeah. super close to you, like something I do is I'll like swivel a chair like parallel um, to the other person like this. And like if it's somebody, I don't know, I mean that can be an awkward thing to, uh, to finesse, but um, it really helps. And like when you get back and you're editing audio, the fact that it's gonna be much clearer that way. Another thing is just to get them in a quiet place, like I hear the my radio ears are all, I can hear yeah. like the fan yeah. in the background, like just being aware of stuff like that um, is so helpful afterward and so it will allay any of the awkwardness that you have early on just sort of taking, you know, knowing that it's going to be better. Um, and that's another advantage please, of, yeah. of having this mic right here is that it's going to cut off any room noise. Yeah. So if someone does walk through or if some papers clatter or whatever, the mic's going to be focused on their voice more so it's going to cut out that Annoying that background noise. Does it look weird? Like they're, you sometimes you see some sports yeah. reporters are starting to do that. On yeah, I mean, you'll like see them with the, the one thing, but if it's just hanging down, I mean, I really don't think it's that uh, distracting. And it's, it's certainly less distracting than bad sound. Mm -hmm. I feel like when I've seen Skype interviews, you almost expect that. Like they're like right. They're like computer, they're like some from, you know, far flung remote location. And right. <laughs> Yeah. Right. Exactly. right. <laughs> <laughs> Recording from my iPhone. Right. Yeah. Um, and like, yeah, we're we're using Skype a lot more as well. And it's funny, like in radio, there's been this shift. I think that there was a real strong like radio aesthetic for a long time. That um, there are people to this day, um, engineers and producers, who think that like the quality of a phone interview is superior to like the crispness of a Skype interview, just because like they think the tinniness of that interview is going to be off-putting. So it's like, I think, we're I think that's behind mm -hmm. us now. Mm -hmm. But, um, you know, it does, it does sound different, and I think we're, like, all becoming more um, at ease with how, like, yeah, exactly, like right. what Skype is, what you expect out of a Skype interview. Um, just, like, the last thing I want to hit on from, from, this, uh, from this handout is uh, if you're out there recording, if you get into radio, um, like it's so cheap and easy to record a ton of stuff and I would just encourage you to, to do that. Um, uh, I think that public radio can sometimes get a bad rap for having um, too much ambient sound and like the gimmick mm. sound of it or whatever, <laughs> but um, you know, it's good, it's good to go into an interview um, just being aware of what the sounds around you are or what could you know, enhance that interview or give a sense of the space in which you're talking to somebody. Um, you know, I find that to be one of the sort of most fun facets of it is just um, trying to create some sense of place through audio, which, uh, which can be challenging. But anyhow, uh, this is good handout. Jay Allison, a good resource, and uh, mm -hmm. good. Okay. Sure. Comment and question. First, if you are recording for yourself, and you're the interviewer, you are being interviewed or you're somehow on, on screen by your computer, know how to manage the software that you're using, whether yes. it's Skype or Adobe Connect or whatever it is. And I'll just tell you that we had to, NPF had to do a webinar one time where everyone was remote because it was a snow day and we had already you know, scheduled it and the guest was remote. And so at some point about a minute before the 
the webinar officially started, but when we already had people in the room, and I thought I was muted, <laughs> the whole world heard me yell to my significant other, never mind, I found it! <laughs> Could have been worse, Linda. <laughs> 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 Another thing I, I forgot to write down. <laughs> Another Don't push me. Don't push me. Another thing to write down that I forgot to write down that's a very good point is to turn off your Outlook, turn yeah. off your Tweet Deck, turn off all of the sounds on your computer. Um, I, I've had to cut um, a number of good answers in interviews because. So, because someone's tweet deck is just going off and going off. Didn't that happen during the Zimmerman trial? Like one of the, like it was something that was televised with George Zimmerman and someone was up and they were showing something on their screen and they didn't shut off their Twitter and things were popping up and everyone started spamming it and all these hashtags kept popping up oh and God. shut down yeah. like the whole thing. It was a couple months ago. It awesome. was hilarious. Um, one other quick question. I have noticed in talking to um, friends in other states, I have on just using the phone, I get much better audio quality if I use FaceTime audio rather than just, call, just calling. Mm -hmm. It's much clearer. Mm -hmm. Is that of any help? Yeah, I mean, so we'll use, um, there's an app called Reported Live. Um, so now I think a lot, like NPR definitely uses it. We use it to some extent. They have to buy a, a physical device, but it's using the same technology, and that is it's using the internet versus uh, whatever the other, so right, exactly. Um, so it works, it gets back to something that you were saying, which is like you, you wanna be um, near a really good connection. And mm -hmm. I think that's true of FaceTime as well. Like it's kind of iffy if you're not right. on Wi-Fi or something like right. that. Um, but uh, yeah, we are, we are making use of alternatives to a landline more often than not. I mean, I think for any, any radio producer worth his salt will tell you not to do an interview on a cell phone. Yeah. Um, when I was at Federal News Radio, we only did live interviews. Nothing was recorded and nothing could be done over again. So we would only do landline connections. Just if someone a wanted challenge, to right? talk on a cell phone, yeah. Yeah, because a lot of people don't have them. But if someone wants to talk on a cell phone, we just would not do it. Yeah. I have a question about the, the white shirt rule. Even mm -hmm. if you're wearing it under a suit, it's still no white shirt. I mean, if, like if you put on a blazer, like that's certainly going to help. Um, but still wouldn't recommend it. I wouldn't recommend it, no. Um, I mean, it's good to just have, like, you know, your neutral TV suit that you just, like, keep in your desk, you know, something like that. It depends. Like, a, a thick stripe like he has would be fine. But if there was something like her seersucker, I mean, it would be like you were tripping if that was on TV. It would just... <laughs> the effect would be strange, even if it was just a little tie or carton even shirt, too. Yeah, <laughs> yeah. You were talking about, um, well, like, so something that, like, the show Fresh Air, uh, Terry Gross is rarely in the studio with her guests. Mm -hmm. um, she's based in Philadelphia, and I think she actually has said that she prefers to talk to people who are um, not there with her, uh, because she wants to hear it as though she was listening to the radio itself. And so... Something that she, a lot of her interviews with people in D.C. are done at Monitor Studios, which is just like a an, an, uh, radio studio on like 15th Street. But they've put up on the wall a photo of her. And that <laughs> sounds very silly, but we would do this actually in our booth as well. You're talking about how you sound and your sense of yourself when you're talking. Mm -hmm. um, and it actually makes a difference to have, I find in radio, maybe in TV as well, if you work with your Skype setup. But just like, it doesn't have to be um, Terry Gross, but just some sense that you're talking normally to somebody across the room. And I know that when we... Um, did training on tracking and stuff like that. It's thinking about how to comport yourself in a way that it's not like, oh, I'm putting on this air, but I'm just having a normal conversation. And uh, it is awkward. I mean, even when I'm not looking, like obviously I'm not doing a Skype interview with video, but it does help just to sort of have a sense of like, oh, you're five feet away from me. This is how I would be talking to you normally. I'm not going to be like stentorian yelling at you loudly, whatever. But right. Anyway. <laughs> Maybe I should be sending cutouts of Chris Eliza to there people. There you go, yeah. <laughs> um, okay, so let me show you some of these interviews. And we get more of a sense of what I'm talking about. I'm going to have to go through 
Is this because of the quick time thing? I don't know. Oh, quick time? I don't yeah. really have quick time on the I don't think You don't, is, but she was, I we were going to play it live on. Like, we didn't, Gillian didn't think it needed quick time to play. Do you want to just try it? It could be just because you pulled it up earlier. And it needed to refresh. Mm, there we go. Okay, great. Okay. Um, where's the sound? Better think in Des Moines. As I've said many times, goes to Iowa by accident. Kathy Obradovich knows that well. She's a flip columnist at the Des Moines Register and joins us now to so give us a state view on Cruz. Okay, Kathy, I want to start with this. I wrote uh, in the so Washington Post awesome. Monday her. paper <laughs> that if today the Iowa Republican caucus was held, Cruz would finish first or second. Am I wrong or right about that? Oh, I think you're absolutely right. And uh, just a, a little anecdote to back that up. Uh, I was talking last week to uh, Bob Vanderplatz, who uh, I know you know him. Absolutely. He's a, one of the top religious conservative leaders in Iowa. And he said that if the Iowa caucuses were held this week, Ted Cruz would lap the field. Now, this is a guy who picked the, the winner in 2012 and 2008. So his opinion carries a little bit of weight. What is it about Cruz? Is it just that he's sort of the it? Thing among the conservative grassroots at the moment. I mean, so we don't have to watch this whole thing, but um, she's just doing so many things right. She has a great open. She has energy. She has the um, the earbud here, and and because it's a Skype interview, like Blake was saying, it's totally forgivable that the image is not that sharp um, because the sound is pretty good. And the content is pretty good. Her energy level is up, and she's wearing a solid bright color. The background leaves something to be desired, but like, we'll go on. And then she's also, when she's talking about Bob Vanderplatz, she remembers, oh, this is someone who I know is like the Iowa insider, but maybe the DC audience doesn't know. So I need to briefly explain who he is. Um, so just to be clear, that's just one iPhone, like regular, like no. Like, so earbuds. this is she's actually on um, a laptop. On but a her computer. earbud is not something, right? What's that? Like her earbud is the. Um, oh, okay. yeah, just the, like your little yeah. iPhone earbuds. Like, right. Yeah, that. Okay. There you go. Yeah. None of you have ever seen this before. Huh? <laughs> <laughs> yeah, yeah. Even just one is fine, as long as we know it's the one that has the mic. Right. <laughs> Who is an amazing journalist, and it was um, distracting from his quality reporting. And if you know any of these people, please don't tell them that they're doing this. Because um, this is not to make fun, this is just so we can learn. <laughs> I think, yeah, I think it's any question. You talk about like doing stuff right. Another yeah. thing, like if you're on a live radio show, if you remember the name of a caller, like if you write that down and refer to that person, that's like big, big point. Albuquerque the voters right? rejected a ban on late term abortions Tuesday, the latest case of this issue playing out in the States. Joe Monahan is a political blogger. <laughs> Albuquerque voters rejected a ban on late term abortions Tuesday. The latest
Before and he joins us now with the state view. Okay, Joe, fascinating result here. Let's talk about what happened and in, who voted and in what numbers. Well, we had a big turnout for Albuquerque. 87,000 people voted. That was around 17,000 uh, more than had voted in the mayoral election just a month earlier, Chris. So that shows you the passions that were ignited here. So he's great. He's got a great voice, but um, he is looking up. He's not looking at the camera. And as you can see, his <laughs> microwave is right here. <laughs> um, that's not even that, like when you were describing it, I was thinking that it would. That was the best we could do to get it out of the shot. Oh, okay. um, After like working with him for like 10 minutes. <laughs> I was just like, it's the stove top or the microwave. Like, good one. And, um, and then, uh, what was the other thing I was, And then he's standing above it. You know, and that's just a it's it's just a little off putting. Um, yeah. I was just curious, like uh, NBC does the same story. Are they going to send a crew out to try to have you know video that doesn't look like that? Yes. Or well, yeah. <laughs> 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 Here, <laughs> I'm just going to show you uh, Steve's talk. So this is um, Evan Smith, who is the editor-in-chief of Texas Tribune, who is amazing. Um, there it is. But this is what happens when um, you have a loud person flooding the microphone um, on the desktop and having the connection failure because of it. We had to chop up this interview significantly because there were huge um, chunks where he was just frozen. And so the parts that we aired were still, oh, you know, Texas Congressman it's not great, Stockman. but you can at least Senator understand John what he's Cornyn saying, but it's distracting. Next year in Texas, Stockman filed the paperwork just before the filing deadline on Monday night. Evan Smith is the editor-in-chief, big boss, head honcho of the Texas Tribune. He joins me now via Skype with a state view. Okay, Evan, I was stunned by this. Uh, let's get cut, cut through all, uh, all the noise. Does Stockman have a realistic chance of beating John Cornyn or not? And tell me why. I'm also stunned. My, my overwhelming emotion, though, yesterday was uh, elation because from the press's perspective, Stockman Mrs. Cornyn for the next few months will be Christmas every day. Uh, but the reality is Stockman is not Ted Cruz, and John Cornyn is not David Dewhurst. He makes Cruz look mainstream. Uh, he also has uh, no money. In fact, he's in... So you can see that. Where Actually, I love his background, and the connection is nice. But because of um, not using the microphone in his ear, it's the microphone is just being flooded with his sound, and then it cuts out. And um, a lot of the cover that we're putting on, the images that we're putting over, we're doing that to cover the fact that we are chopping out parts of the interview that you just can't even hear um, because the, the audio is having so many issues. Is that a mirror behind him? It's just it's reflecting. Light, it's, it's, a, a, it's a frame. Yeah. A frame, yeah. And then that's the other thing is that it's yeah. the computer, again, is pointed up. And then you have... Um, another one, what, what do you tell people in terms of how to position their computers? Because I've seen a lot of people now are talking down to us. Do you, are, should, I mean, you should be looking at the camera, but should the camera be at eye level? Yeah, I yeah, mean, that's but, the best. yeah, absolutely. And we'll, I mean, we'll have some people who will, you know, be stacking books to get it 
to look right. Um, and it's worth the extra effort, you know, to, to do that. Um, let me... So this is someone um, who, I won't make you um, watch this whole interview, but <coughs> again, the camera is not in a great spot. There's light behind her that I feel is distracting. And then she kind of bears the message her is GOP um, a She has a great line in it that, Martha you know, campaign finances. Cynthia Needham is Martha Coakley made a rookie mistake. Boston, She's not a rookie, but it's like a minute and okay, a half into the campaign finance uh, she started is always selling, complicated. The Can you boil this down for us as what's being alleged here? I'll try. Um, so Martha Coakley, who is the attorney general in this state, um, has a number of things, a number has had a number of problems with her campaign finance reports as of late. Um, number one, she used about $6,000 in federal money from her federal account for activities that were obviously involved with her state bids for office. Then she uh, filed several reports which were riddled with errors, and on top of it, she paid $35,000 from her federal account to try to fix the errors and also hired her sister to backstop and fix the errors. Then the FEC tries to get in touch with her to tell her you've got problems and she never responds. Just by way of context, Coakley was a Democratic nominee in the special election right. to replace Ted Kennedy, but she is remaining the Attorney General and is now running for governor in the state. These are not hugely egregious errors. We're talking about $6,000, not a lot of money. But Martha Coakley is the Attorney General, which means that it's her job to prosecute people who do exactly what she's done, um, make campaign finance errors and violations. And so that's where the problem comes in. And have they, uh, has either Coakley's office, Coakley's campaign, have they? Anyway, it's another like 30 or 40 seconds where she has this great line of, Martha Coakley's not a rookie, but she's making rookie errors. And that would have been great to open with. Now you've got my attention. Now give me the one, two, three that she started with. Um, and then also having the camera above her, as you can see, it just feels kind of um, childish. <laughs> <laughs> um, or, or I'm just, I'm, I'm not sure I want to take her seriously. And then there's one, I just want to show you someone doing a great job. the Texas clinics that perform abortions will have to stop Friday after a federal appeals court allowed most of the state's new abortion law to take effect. Emily Ramshaw is the editor of the Texas Tribune and she joins us now to explain. Okay, Emily, I want to start basic here. What happened Friday and how did we get here? What happened Friday is that at least nine abortion clinics stopped providing the procedure. Uh, this was a result of a Thursday night ruling by the Fifth Circuit Court of Appeals that Texas could go ahead and implement uh, House Bill 2, which is a measure that provides very strict abortion regulations in Texas. And let me ask, is this something that the Texas political or legal or legal political class was expecting? We've had a lot of legal and political machinations on this over the last 10, 15 days. So I think there was an expectation that the district court in Austin would rule that HB2 was unconstitutional. You know, in Austin, it's a pretty liberal community. Anyway, um, she is awesome and amazing. You can see the background is great. And the Denver Post does this too, where they literally just take like Denver Post wrapping paper and like put it up on the wall behind them right beforehand. And then they like stick a couple of words that they want 
in the background. Um, <laughs> and, and it's great. And, and, and then you can see she's got, you can hardly even see that she's got the mic right here, so the sound is wonderful. Um, and, the, and then her content is great and very clear. Um, and so what, what, could, wait, what could she have done to prevent the splashes of light? Chest, cheeks, forehead. Uh, a little more powder. <laughs> I mean, oh, really? Honestly, yeah. yeah. The lights. Um, right. Yeah, I mean, we also, if we hadn't been under a, a time crunch, could have easily corrected that. Mm -hmm. um, but yeah, so. But it seems like it's a lighting issue, not yeah. a makeup issue, right? Yeah, I mean, we we could have corrected that, but it's it's a little. <laughs> it looks like the light source is like actually too okay. close to her, yeah. mm -hmm. but that is something. Great. Anyway, so that's what I thought, I thought was helpful. What questions or comments do you all have for all the In the middle of the afternoon. I remember this well. Yes. <laughs> <laughs> not interviewing questions about Plus TV. And since, since its launch, mm -hmm. um, what are some like, unexpected changes you've had to make mm. in the plan for TV for web? Well, <laughs> <laughs> uh, in, no, I'm, I did mean to cover this, so I'm glad you're asking. In December, they decided, oh, actually having shows on, on the web is a terrible idea. And so we're going to get rid of it entirely. And um, so they didn't, they didn't fire anybody or anything like that. But they noticed that certain kinds of clips worked really well, um, but that people weren't watching the show as a show. Um, so they've completely reorganized everything um, just by um, no more shows, just more subject matter types of things. So that's why my position has changed somewhat. So one of the things that they noticed is that um, in terms of video, explainers do a great job. So our most watched video ever is Obamacare in two minutes, right? Everyone's always talking about Obamacare, but do you actually know what is in this law? Um, and so we spent a good amount of time just making a really snappy, quick video explaining the law in two minutes, and it's been viewed millions of times. And it's a, that's something that you can embed into a lot of the print and online content, or not print, but the online content. Um, and so that's the team that I'm on now, a special, special projects, explainers. There's still a political team that's still doing state view interviews because those also have been really successful. Um, but I'm not on that team anymore. And the post TV videos stand alone on the site, right? They're not really riding on top of a lot of Washington Post stories. Um, there's, we're definitely trying to get more of that happening now, of it going across and being embedded and accompanying um, pieces now, because the show concept did not work out well. Um, so that's what's that's going on. That's what I was so cool about it, it I work at USA Today and we're doing something similar, which is like, right. if there's a story, what can we make a video on to put it on to get an ad to play? And it's, it, it's exciting to be part of the video thing, but it's discouraging because it's kind of like, what if we could do this really cool video that would be a great piece? And like, well, it's better to do three videos that can get on things that can ride and play an ad. So uh, when I heard about Post TV, I just thought it was so cool that the focus was on that. And it's a bummer that uh, the, the traffic and the money they got. Yeah. Ads. Yeah. I mean, I mean it was. Too, so. huh? Even the New York Times video was having trouble. Like there was an article in Capital New York about how they did this whole ad buy and it like hasn't like met expectations. Even mm -hmm. though it's like hell. It's just like oh wow. Well, isn't that what you were talking about, the challenge with terrestrial radio? People are wanting to be able to pick and choose. Well, this 30 seconds here, and this two-minute thing here, and this, instead of coming at 7 o'clock and watching. You know, right, thing. right. People weren't sitting down at 4 o'clock to watch in play with Chris Eliza. Like, it just, mm -hmm. it wasn't happening. But the clips that we were doing, like the state views, or um, Chris would write a blog post on the fix, you know, pitching to the, the clip, those did great. Um, and something that we talk about a lot is that we still don't think that a video on the web has been completely figured out. And so that's great because there's room for us to experiment and try new things. And, you know, you can, I'm very fortunate to be um, 
at an organization that's really interested in trying new things and um, willing to take risks and you know willing to fail and so part of the in-play experiment did fail but we learned so many things from it and I think these state views is one of them um, that you know we're just kind of building on that now yeah, I just love yeah. And do you know Jolie Lee? Sorry? Jolie Lee? Yeah. Yeah. We used to work together at Federal News Radio. She was like just across the video studio from me. Awesome. <laughs> I know that you guys said that you like try to work to the best quality of Skype. Do you find that like the viewer feedback or, or comments or anything like that, um, people aren't okay with the fact that the video quality is not there? I think people are more forgiving of the image. Um, we have, you know, we have cover if it gets really bad and, and just to kind of keep it moving, you know, you can get all the photos in there. The sound, people are not as forgiven because you need to be able to hear the content mm -hmm. without putting any effort into it. If people have to work to hear the story, they're just going to stop watching the video. Yeah. <laughs> or stop listening. <laughs> yeah. Um, so you, you were talking about... Um, trying to be responsive to your listenership, viewership online, and yeah. trying to figure out, do you want a transcript, do you want a written story, and I'm wondering what um, in your studio newsroom are people the most opposed to, or what kind of changes are the hardest to make digitally? Um. I don't mean anything that, that anything that adds a lot of time, I think. So, um, for instance, it wasn't that hard for us to post transcripts because we would just essentially do a few changes to a script and that would go online. Um, when we tried out webifying that, there were a lot of reporters who said, "Look, I've been spending all day on this radio piece, putting the story together. The last thing I want to do now is, you know, however long it would take, turning it into a, a print story." Um, so it takes coaxing, I think, making the case for that. Something that we've found is we were doing a webified story for every piece that airs on Marketplace, and um, what we found is people just don't go to them. If you look at when someone comes to our site, what they read, it is the explainer, um, you know, it's the it's the special content versus the sort of run-of-the-mill stuff. So, mm -hmm. you know, if somebody, I think if somebody's going to make that effort, they're going to listen to the piece, probably. Um, so, I think people in my newsroom, at least, are willing to do more, provided they know that that's going to some end, that's mm -hmm. Good and so, like I think, is the case at, at Post TV, um, at APM or at NPR. A big debate now is you know we're so we're so used to the concept of the show and there's so much pride that goes into like the music between <laughs> stories and the balance <laughs> right. of stories and that is very much the aesthetic of public radio at least as it is I think with with television shows too. And so, if you with an iPhone app or an iPad app or online allow the listener to, sh to shuffle things or pick stories that they want to hear? Are you mm -hmm. losing something? Are you going to start like, you know, is the, is the reporter who's doing the art stories not going to have as big a listenership? Anyway, so it's like, it, it brings up all those problems. But I think that, again, to get back to it, like, people are willing to do the work if they know it's not in vain. And I think that something that's really helped in my newsroom is just more constant communication about what's working and what isn't. Mm -hmm. And the, the, the nimbleness, the willingness to try different things is great. Um, you know, I think that what really sucks is if you're, you know, really working at something and wondering, you know, why am I doing this or who's looking at this or, you know, why did I have to spend 30 minutes doing something that <laughs> I just don't know what, what it's going to yield. And when you're evaluating your user feedback, are you hearing from them in a certain way or are you going by your metrics? What's your it's mostly metric based, um, but, you know, we pay attention to comments. I think that's something we go back and forth on as well as how much to wade into the comment section. Um, you know, I think that's true of social media as well. Um, I'm pretty diligent about replying to tweets that are like germane to the story itself, but, um, you know, I think there's metrics are driving things more. I don't mean that in a way that I feel like the work I'm doing is kind of beneath, like, <laughs> that's like driving everything, but um, I personally, I don't know if others would agree, um, kind of value that. Like, I want to know what's successful or what's getting a lot of hits, or like, if I put up a radio story, we can tell how long somebody's been on the page. So we know if somebody's listened to the whole piece. Like, it's interesting because we haven't had that in the past. I think you, maybe in TV, like the, the, the ratings are more sophisticated than radio, but it's, it's nice to know um, what a listener's behavior is like in a way that you haven't been able to before. And so to an extent, um, metrics online can tell you that. Yeah. I think that's something that was really revealing with Post TV too that is um, driving the team that I'm on now is that you know our sort of um, old news idea 
is to to just you know do the new news and then explain in you know backwards chronological order and what we've noticed is that our explainers if in video people want to understand the concept of something in a video they just they really like it so we just did um you know the ukraine crisis in two minutes on friday and people have been watching the heck out of it all weekend and that was something that was really nice to me because i always want to explain the context and the history and the i'm a history nerd first you know before i came to journalism and so, you know, my bosses are always like, push the story forward, push new angle. And I'm like, no context. And so it was kind of nice to be like, look, people are watching the explainers. People want to know what the heck it is and what's going on and what this has to do with Catherine the Great, you know. And, and, um, and so that's been, that's been really nice of like specifically in video, people are, are watching that kind of stuff. Um, so that was really encouraging. I also found, too, that, um, so I was at NPR, like, right when they were really staffing up their digital side, and I mentioned there was, like, maybe not some antagonism, but just each side didn't know how to make sense of the other. Um, something that really ameliorated that is, um, you know, being able to collaborate and work together. I think that there are so many people at my show now who have been in radio for a long time who are eager to try something new, if that's an explainer video, if that's um, some graphic, it's like, they want to they want to make the investment into that if that's going to work they'd like to try it but um there has to be sort of a collaborative relationship with the people who know how to do that and i think that that's something that like our organization's been working at now for a while it's definitely the case at npr just sort of how you you know like i i would love to do something but show me how to do it and i think that yeah. that's something that's what we're continuing to work on i guess yeah. uh, question, uh, how much of when you when you're Debating how to how much resources to put on the web, how much of that are you just chasing the idea that everybody's going to the web? Um, do you see that does the NPR or marketplace see that there's actually revenue to come out of that? And, and the reason I ask is when I go to my NPR app on my iPad and I get to a story that looks good and I click on it and it's just text, which is maybe two out of three uh -huh. or one out of two, I'm really frustrated because you know I could have read the New York Times, right. I could have read but all these hundreds of other places. I came to Europe because I wanted to hear this great radio journal. So maybe I'm cooking breakfast or doing something. Mm -hmm. And yet, and now you're like, you want me to read this? Well, why don't I just go to, you know, somewhere else to read? Yeah. Right. And, and so it's like, well, that's what you do well. And so these reporters are asking 20 minutes to web up by their story. Yeah. They're not, they don't do that. Right. Well, you know? well you've, you've hit on uh, the real heart of this debate. And I think that there are people who have been at both of these networks for a long time who say, look, if I, if I report a piece for All Things Considered, um, 15 million people are going to listen to that and you know how many people are going to go to the website and see it? it's a much smaller amount um, talk about sort of evolution with within the thinking for this mm -hmm. um, you know I think the expectation going into it kind of blindly at first was people are going to go to our website or those who heard the piece and then want to go to the website to seek something out and I think that what NPR has found and again their apparatus is like much bigger than ours now is that um, they discovered that people who were going to stories on the web probably had not heard them on the radio. Maybe they didn't listen to radio reg regularly. So it was kind of opening the door to this other audience. But what you're getting at, I think, is something that, like, we go around and around and around about, which is, um, you know, I think there is this sense that things are changing and that the website has to offer more than audio. But how do you showcase that? And as you're saying, I mean, that's something that, like, you don't, you don't want to lose sight of what you're known for, what you do well. Mm -hmm. um, it's how you frame that and how you present that. And, you know, uh, it's just, it's funny you say that. I've heard, I've heard so many people say the same thing, which is, uh, you know, they're, they're very loyal radio listeners and want, want the audio above all else. And, um, you know, if should that be what's paramount? Should that be what's presented above all else? There's a business model on the web that would expand your resources. And, but you know, nobody's making, not, hardly anybody's making money on the web. So yeah. It seems like you're just detracting from the one thing that people actually are willing to pay and their pledge drives and all that. Right, so this is a very thorny thing, not to get too much in the weeds, too, but it's uh, you can't go to NPR's website, for instance, and podcast All Things Considered or Morning Edition. And the reason for that is that the way that NPR was set up was by this by this collective of member stations. And so mm -hmm. the that, that continues to this day into the Internet age. And what's weird about that is that if, if you could go and listen to All Things Considered on this from NPR, you could just bypass WAMU completely. Right. Um, you could bypass your local station, and, and they rightfully live in fear of that, 
because they have news staffs, they have their own shows, they have their own local underwriting. Um, so that's also like poses particular problems for public radio is you have the what you the way in which this was all set up. Um, the web has changed that. How do you and so you bring up the the NPR app? I mean, the sort of genius of that is is that you can set it to your local station yourself, or you can do it through the location services on your phone, right. and you're still going to go through the WAMU stream of that show. So that sort of satisfies them for now. But it's been a really big complicating factor for public radio because you know NPR now is quite mammoth, American Public Media quite mammoth as well in terms of size, and like I'm sure there are plenty of people who would like to, you know, give away more content directly to the listener. Um, but that is that is a variable that they can't ignore. Um, I think the, the board of directors is still majority stations. So. Do, do they care that when I go onto my app, sometimes I like to listen to the LA station or the Florida station? I'm sure they prefer that you listen to the DC one, but no, they don't. I mean, I think as long as you're going through that route of listening through right. the station, I think that that's, that's what they care about most. But I know stations, like you might now consider donating to the LA station, so it just sort of changes the economic landscape of it as well. So. What makes your decision? I know people who work at the Florida station, and I have someone who lives in LA, and so I helps me connect with her to know what her local situation is. So it's I do the local station app thing because I want to listen to a specific show when I want to. Right. So yeah. I can search by show, and like sometimes I'm listening to Hawaii, yeah. and it's just like Late that's night. who happens right. to yeah. be playing my show right then. Yeah. <laughs> How is it different? Because I actually go through the public radio app, uh -huh. and yeah. I, cause I, always, I used to be an intern at WNYC, okay. yeah, yeah. I listened to Brian there and all those guys, so I just... Yeah, and they have their own app now themselves. And I mean, I think what you're finding too, I was mentioning you have like 800 stations now trying to differentiate themselves and you have big stations like the one in New York, which, you know, if, I think if you ask most people who live in New York, what's NPR, they might say WNYC. I mean, it's yeah. such a, it's yeah. a titan in its own right and it has a new staff of probably 20 plus reporters itself. So, um, I mean, there are opportunities there, I think, for stations, particularly in major markets to, you know, I, I listen to WNYC as well. Yeah. Like I like to listen to Brian Lehrer and it's sort of like, you know, they, they can sort of recognize that they can have something that people outside of New York want to listen to as well. So, yeah. <laughs> as far as uh, writing for, for Baltimore, uh, I write for, for print, and obviously the way I write is different than what you write for uh, video. Can you give just like what are the top tips for someone who normally writes for print but wants to do something multimedia online that has, you know, more difference from media and some clips, like what's yeah, well, should chime as well, but I, I try to um, keep it very active, uh, you know, keep things in the present tense and um, try on Marketplace especially, it's, it, was, it was, when I first moved there, the show is so conversational and it becomes this kind of burden that you have to carry that you, you want to sound uh, relaxed and conversational and it, uh, the first few months are kind of crazy making because it seems so hard as you try to write a script, like make it sound like this is how I would say somebody else, yeah. but just Getting into that mindset of, um, you know, keeping sentences short, but descriptive, vivid, um, and the way that you would speak them to a friend or a family member, and, um, you know, I think that a particularly tough transition for print reporters, I've seen it as, you know, you, you, you uh, are encouraged, I think, at Markley, not to be ungrammatical, but, you know, use contractions or, or make it, you know, be a little uh, loose and fast with that stuff. Um, it does make a difference. I just think... I talked about like posting the photo of somebody in the studio or whatever, just having that sense that you're talking to somebody um, and as you're writing, bearing that in mind does make a big difference, I think. Mm -hmm. I mean, we write in, in columns, two columns of what we want to see and what we want to say next to each other. And my, my boss is constantly just cutting out more words, taking out more of the script. It's like, I want to see it. I don't want to say it. I want to see it. And it's the same thing. Like I'm, I'm still in the process of being like disabused of full grammatical sentences from from writing print stories, you know. So, so it's like I can just say jet lag, you know. That's my intro, <laughs> you know. <laughs> now let's get to the scientists, you know. <laughs> like <laughs> instead of instead of like jet lag, what a pain you, huh? You know, like <laughs> jet lag is a thing. We're blah blah blah, and no, you know. So, um, and and. I don't know. I don't know. I mean, helping helping to write in the in the two columns and always thinking about what I want to be seeing um, is helpful for that. 
you're trying to think of someone that you'd like to interview um, or have your host interview for a show, because um, now we're all kind of being asked to do more everything, yeah. produce, right, sell your thing to the people who are going to put it on the site. Yeah. Um, what tips do you have? Like, if you, if you are talking to someone, what about them makes you think like, oh, I should keep them in mind to be written it back? Is it um, are they like, articulate, not rambling, coming big? Because who was it that pulled it up and showed two? One was like a, a hidden. It was you? You had to. It didn't work. One you had to like kind of search for their nugget of a great quote, and another was just having great clips spewing out of him. But there was good things in both of them. So when you what what should I be doing when I'm meeting people to decide if I want to grab them later? Um, I mean, we're not, when it's hard because a lot of the people that we're interviewing, we've never met um, in real life. Like, we want to go find someone in Colorado to talk about this story. Um, and immediately I'll, you know, I'll do looking around at the local news and get a couple names. And then I just start looking at their videos, see if they have any videos, see if they've been interviewed and um, what they look like. That was the process generally for us. But, I mean, if you're meeting people out in the world, you know, you can say, like, I can go on camera, I can do Skype interviews, like, absolutely. Like I said, like, the easier you're going to make things for a producer technically, the more likely you are to be called. Yeah, I mean, I, I would totally agree with that. I think at radio that's the same, like, just volunteering. Like, I can get to a landline, I can get to a studio. Like, those right. are like, wow, music to my ears if I'm a producer and I hear that. Um, you know, I think, like, when, when I was doing kind of sustained booking again at Talk of the Nation, it's like, it's funny, um, you get to a point where, like, pre-interviews are really important, and that's always such a fine line to toe, because you want to get to the point at which they're about to emote or tell you something fascinating, and then you'll be like, all right, save that for the real deal, you know? Um, but when you do enough of those, you kind of pick up on, like, I, I remember thinking, like, oh, I could decide within a couple of minutes if that person mm -hmm. is going to be good or bad for a radio interview, and it's just... Again, the pre-interview is so helpful knowing, okay, like you're not stumbling a lot. Um, you can give me a really good summary of what we're going to talk about, maybe a couple anecdotes that are interesting. Mm -hmm. um, so, I mean, it's not that, what I say, it's not that sophisticated, I guess. I mean, it's probably harder when you're dealing with the visual aesthetic, but, um, you know, you want to be able to carry on like a good, fluid conversation with somebody and know that he or she can talk about something lucidly um, maybe you throw a curveball, how do they react to that? Um, I'd say those are the main things. So is that part of your, like, your pre-interviews, part of your preparation? Do you ask, do you let that interviewer know, interviewee know that these are the questions that we're going to probably talk about? Not that explicitly, okay. but I'd say, oh, we're going to do a show on, um, I don't, well, okay, we're going to do a show on the debt ceiling. Mm -hmm. I'd love to talk to you a bit about it. Um, I might, I mean, I'd be explicit, I'd say this is, you know, pre-interview, I'd love to just talk to you, get your sense of what you've been covering. Um, I'm not, like, showing all my cards, like, this is the, these are the questions we're going to ask or where I'm going to take it, but, um, you know, I don't know how it worked when you were, when you were working on your show, but um, we weren't slotting people into certain positions, but we knew that, like, we wanted the reporter to be able to, like, give us the lay of the land, what's happening. And so there were, like, things that I knew that guest would have to be able to do or accomplish. Um, and so... Yeah, and I, I just to get back to what I was saying at the very beginning, like I think the, the pre-interview can work for both sides. Like it's mm -hmm. helpful for me, like I know if you're good or bad. Uh, <laughs> yeah. I know how, I get a sense of how it's going to go. But it's also like helpful for you, the person who could be interviewed, to find out, like you, you don't want to go in a situation where you're having to make up stuff or you don't know an answer to a lot of questions. Like it should be a, a, a point at which you're able to figure out sort of where things are headed and what you're going to be expected to do. Um, I guess for for Gillian and for anyone who works in television, um, for people like myself who work in the print world and TV is still sort of foreign, um, these tips are really helpful. But is there anything <coughs> that we can do at home to sort of practice? Like one or two steps, I don't know if it's talking in a mirror, or like <laughs> having like someone like interview you, like what what's good to all of those things. Have the opportunity you don't yeah, I mean talking into a mirror, absolutely. Practicing with someone to, and and a great thing that I think you guys are going to do later is to just um, take an article that you wrote and have someone read it and then ask you about it and tell the story of the article. Um, and, and, you know, you probably have to do this with your editor a lot when you're pitching stories in the morning. 
you know, of like, oh, I want to write about this law in Texas that blah, 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 you know, and you kind of have to make it exciting in order for your editor to <laughs> give you the story, right? And be like, here's my lead, bam, you know? Um, and and so thinking about it that way. And, and you can, you know, practice back and forth with people, but take an article that you've actually written and then just try and tell the story of it. And would you suggest taking a video of your phone as practice or? Yeah, absolutely. Oh, I mean, sure. yeah. <laughs> I, uh, I've done very little television, but I remember when I did it recently thinking, wow, this went by really quickly. And to get back to something I was saying, just right. having a sense of the length of time of an interview is so helpful. I think a problem that I'd often encounter when I was booking people is a guest would want to dump all the information that he had right, right at the get-go. And so just getting a sense of like, okay, we're going to talk for five minutes. Like, how could I parcel that out? Or like, what what's a good, good time? Like, how long is yeah. a good length for an answer? Like five it's really minutes helpful. would be an insanely long interview for us. Um, it's like two to three is kind of the sweet spot, especially for web video. Um, and your first answer, you know, that, that opening like, boom, this is what's happening. This is my analysis. Um, generally like seven seconds is kind of the sweet spot for the first answer. And then you let the, the, um, the host, you know, be like that, do the sort of, how did it get to be that way kind of question. Well, it's very funny that you ask because in 2006, blah, blah, blah. You know, and that's where like, and then you can tell the story. Yeah, so. and that's where like prep helps. Just like again, a, a bulleted list of like this. You know, this could go by really quick, but I want to make sure that I say this one thing or these two things. Like again, you're not writing out your answer, but but having that in front of you or just having that before you go into the interview, knowing like yeah, I want to make sure that I get this across. I think is helpful, probably for both mediums. Yeah, I mean, even even if if you're you know an objective journalist, you still have an an aim. Um, and what you're trying to say. And so it's, it's good to think about, like, what is my objective in this interview? It's to impart this piece of information and that piece of information. And then you can just sort of follow the questions that you're being asked around that, but keeping your, you know, the objective of the story in mind. That seems to be, though, sometimes a awesome? challenge when you want to be brief, but if the question isn't leading you into one of the points you want to make, like, how do you get to your point without having a question that, or an answer that's totally rambling. I'd say like you, you brought up like, if you don't know the answer, don't say, don't pretend to know the answer, but those are like really great opportunities to pivot in those directions that you want, you want to go, yeah. I would say. So that's a really good question, yeah. you have to find out. But one thing, I mean, yeah. it's like you can say. But I do know <laughs> yeah, 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 yeah. that that guy's not so, running for seven. Yeah, you yeah. can sort of <laughs> Well, and that's also, I mean, if you, if the producer has done a good job with the pre-interview and all of that, I mean, what the, what we're looking for and what you're trying to say should pretty much be in alignment. That's positing a good producer. Okay. I've walked in on the awkward silence. <laughs> <laughs> Any, anything else for our guests? Okay. Let's thank them very thank much. You. Thank you. Thank you.